Hi, Pastor Steve here. I want to thank you for listening today, and I want to encourage you because I know that God will truly bless you as you study His Word. So hey, let's get started. Good morning, Lawrence Heights Christian Church. We can do a thousand times better than that. Good morning, Lawrence Heights Christian Church. I mean, there's lovely weather outside, amen. This is a, this is a great day to worship the Lord. Let's stand to our feet as we begin by singing some songs of praise to him, giving glory, giving praise and honor to our one and only Savior. It's in his name and his name alone that we can unite. Let's sing that together. People come together. Strange as neighbors, our blood is one. Children of generations of every nation of kingdom cup. So don't let your heart trouble. Hold your head up high, don't fear no. Evil. Fix your eyes on this one trip. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. Oh, 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 oh. church. Swing wide, 
first good grace going by His name is Jesus We sing His name Jesus Our redemption Come on church Our salvation Is in His blood Oh we sing Jesus Light of heaven Friend forever, His kingdom come. Oh my, that the highest one would welcome me. I was lost, but He brought me. voices and sing that again. Something isn't adding up This wild exchange you offer us I gave my worst, you gave your blood Seems hard to believe You're telling me you chose the cross You're telling me I'm worth that much that's the measure of your love How else would I sing But completely Soul out sincerely abandoned I'm complete Free Hands to the ceiling And amber My own life and death your surrender and to be not 
out of my room and yours I'm completely Don't care who sees me abandoned Oh, I I just can't get over it What kind of self-control is this? You had angels at your fingertips But on the cross you remain yeah. And I can't repay that kind of love But I can praise with everything I've got since death had all his power off Then just like the grave I'm completely Sold out sincerely abandoned I'm completely free Hands to the ceiling and never oh, My own life and never to match your surrender and to me not my will and yours I'm completely don't care who sees me abandoned oh I surrender all I surrender all I surrender Best of my soul, each phase of my life, each breath in my lungs, consider it yours, Lord. Consider it yours, Lord. The failures I hide, the victories I turn, the battles I fight, each crown that I hold, consider it yours. The praise of the heavens, the kingdom to come. Consider He yours, Lord. Oh, consider it yours. And I'm completely sold out sincerely at this. Your surrender to me, not my will, but yours. I'm completely don't care who sees me abandoned. Oh, I surrender all. Never leave me abandoned. I surrender all. Amen, church. You may be seated at this time for a moment of communion. Good morning. I'm uh, I'm Conrad Mast. My wife Cindy and I are, are members here at the Heights, and my son Noah and I, we, we like watching videos together that discuss different, you know, spiritual concepts or philosophical topics, you know, to use as, as a catalyst for really interesting conversations. He, uh, you know, he's a young guy, he's got to philosophize, you know, he's, he's also really intelligent, so please hit him up for, you know, deep conversations. Anyway, um, recently we watched one, one video that broke down how these, these two protagonists in a film they, they both had really skewed views of, of the world uh, around them, and, and it, it showed how their viewpoints 
uh, made it difficult for them to, to relate to each other and to, you know, it, it really hindered them. And, and of course, you know, it's the resolution of that. But that, that video really made me think of, of how the different people in scripture uh, viewed Jesus. And the, so I just wanna look at a couple verses here and, and kind of talk about it. So Luke 4 uh, is the first one, and it details a time early in Jesus' ministry when he returned to his hometown of Nazareth. And, and he went to the synagogue and was asked to read from the prophet Isaiah, um, starting in verse 20. And he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, doubtless you'll quote me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. And what, what we've heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. So, so the people of Nazareth, they'd seen Jesus grow up and, you know, there in, you know, in their town. And they, but they, they just kept seeing him as Joseph's son, you know, this, this little kid. They, they couldn't move past that and see him for, you know, the Messiah that he really was. They just, there was a disconnect in their head and, and they just had these preconceived ideas um, about who he was. Next, in, in Matthew chapter 12, the scribes and Pharisees, they saw Jesus as, you know, like this imposter, this threat to their political power, you know, and, and so they, they were constantly seeking to test him and, you know, try to poke holes in, in something. So in, in Matthew 12, uh, verse 38, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So Jesus knew that the Pharisees, they, they weren't ready to accept him for who he truly was. Later, some of them did, which is awesome. But at that time, they, they just they refused to, um, they just couldn't get over their preconceived ideas. Like they were expecting uh, this, this conquering, you know, Messiah, this, you know, you know new David to come in and, and free them from the Romans. And, and they just couldn't imagine that instead he could come there and free them from their sins, which was much more important anyway. Um, and, and so they just had trouble getting over that. Um, later in, in Matthew 16, we can see how, um, how the people's views changed over time and how um, Jesus' disciples uh, thought of him as well. Uh, in Matthew 16, verse 13, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they, say, uh, and they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, the, the people had, had some idea that Jesus was unique because they, you know, like, eh, maybe he's a prophet, something. And, and so they, they realized that God was working mightily through him, and they were almost there. At least they were, you know, they, at least they were open to seeing him for who he was. But the disciples who'd walked with him and, and who were with him constantly, they did see him, and, and they could see truly who he was, you know, the, the savior of the world. So thinking on this, you know, makes me contemplate, you know, who do I see Jesus as? You know, we've, I've you know, grown up in church, and we, we hear, you know, about, about him, you know, through the, the word and, and everything. Um, he's our Messiah. You know, he's coming back for us someday soon. And, and I don't want to just, you know, hear it, but I want to actually, you know, truly, you know, believe it and live it out. And so I encourage you in that too. Um, here at the Heights, we practice open communion. This means that we encourage all who've accepted Jesus as their, uh, as their Savior to join us as we remember Christ's sacrifice for us. Each stack contains two cups, the uh, uh, one with the bread representing Christ's body that was broken for us, and the other with the juice representing his, his blood shed for us. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, so much for, for allowing us to, to learn from your word and uh, to see you as you, as you really are, as you'd, like to, as you'd like us to see you. Um, please help us to learn and understand and to, to grow. In Jesus' name, amen.
church family, there's no rush at all, but whenever you're ready, please stand as we continue to sing together and worship our Messiah, our wonderful Savior, Jesus. Once again, good morning, church. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. <laughs> now, if you're not happy or you don't know whether you're happy or not, just know we love you. We're praying God's blessing on your life. But you also need to know that God cares a whole lot more about our holiness than our happiness. And I'm so glad that you joined us here for Bible study and worship today. Before they get very far, let's show our appreciation for our praise team leading us in worship today. Wasn't it great having Grace back today? We've missed her voice. Can we praise God for her? Yeah. In case you didn't know, my name is Steve. I'm the old guy here on our ministry team. And, well, when you get old like me, you find yourself spending time just reflecting back over the years. 
For example, I remember being a freshman in college some 38 years ago now, and in an intro to psychology class, I remember the professor giving a lecture one day on memory and specifically the limbic imprinting that it can occur in our brain in which neural pathways are formed to help us remember things. And the professor that day, he pulled out a set of keys very much like this one. I'm not sure if you can see that from where you're at, but the professor asked us to look at the keys, and then he asked a question. He said, if I asked you to describe these at the end of the class period, would you be able to recall or remember them? Most of us said, yes, absolutely. Now, I have, just in case you can't see it, four brass-colored keys and then one special Allen wrench doohickey kind of thing that allows me to unlock the security doors here at the church. But if I asked you at the end of our time together today to describe, would you be able to say you had four brass-colored keys and one special doohickey Allen wrench kind of a thing? Would you be able to do that? How many of you would be able to do that? How about if I asked you tomorrow, would you be able to recall that? Anybody? Show of hands. How about next Sunday when we get together? Would you be able to? Some of you say you could do that. You'd be able to recall. Isn't that fascinating how I tell you something just one time like this, and yet it's imprinted on your brain. Neural pathways have been created so that you can recall my keys. Now, I say that because many of you have heard our church's mission and vision statement every single week, but yet you struggle to articulate it when you're called upon. And if you're new around here or wondering what all the fuss is all about, our mission here is to follow Jesus, love people, and reach the world. That is why we exist. We're also passionately pursuing a vision that God has given us to reach 1% of Lawrence for Jesus Christ. That's 1,000 people that we want to reach with the gospel. You need to know that that's just who we are as a church. That is our culture here. It's our DNA. And my prayer is that you would truly embrace these things to the point where they're not just imprinted up here in your head, but also deep in your heart. We want you to be actively involved in this effort. In fact, one of the easiest ways for you to get started can be found there inside your bulletin. Hopefully you grabbed one of these on your way in. This is your weekly connection to many of the things that are going on here at the church. And we really would like to connect with you personally. So if you'd be so kind, take a moment, find that little tear-off connections card there inside. Fill out a little bit of information. Let us know how we can best meet your ministry needs. Or if you happen to have a, a prayer request, we have an intercessory prayer team that meets on Thursday nights that would love to lift you in prayer throughout this coming week. So just fill that out. And then for your convenience, you can tear it out and you can leave it in the offering box back in the back on your way out. Your bulletin's got lots of other key announcements for you to be aware of, lots of things going on, but I especially want to draw your attention to the ice cream social that we're going to be having here Saturday night. Please, please, please join this special celebration that's going to mark the pastoral transition that we've been working on for the last couple of years now. Pastor Ben and I are going to be switching roles beginning August 1st, and quite frankly, I'll confess, I just wanted to have an excuse to party with you guys and have ice cream. But we really do have a lot to rejoice and praise God for. Amen? Amen? Amen. So don't miss out. Seriously, guys, don't let the extent of your experience here just be coming and sitting in a seat here on Sunday mornings. There's so much more for you to get plugged into. And one of those is going to be this Saturday night here at 7 p.m. There's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer. You can bring your favorite ice cream or a topping or some other sweet treat to share. But don't miss out. Now, if you've been with us in recent weeks, then you know that we are in a series studying the fruit of the Spirit together, the fruit of the Spirit that's listed in Galatians chapter 5. So if you haven't done so already, go ahead and grab your Bible nearby, begin making your way to two places today. We're going to start out again there in Galatians chapter 5, and then we're going to use that to springboard into Matthew chapter 11. So Galatians 5, Matthew 11. You're going to find both of those on the New Testament side of your Bible. Love to hear those pages turning, especially in the digital age that we live in. Listen, I'm so old that when I was a kid, we just had the Testament. Now we have the Old and New Testaments. Thank you for that courtesy chuckle. On that note, we should probably pray, right? And ask God to be our teacher here this morning. Would you be so kind as to pray with me? 
Heavenly Father, whether we know it or not or whether we're willing to say it or not, we need you, Lord. We thank you for your word that's alive and powerful. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, who's the ultimate teacher, who gives us understanding of your word. God, would you please change us here today? We don't want to just come to a building and listen to some guy talk. No, Lord, we want to be changed. So we surrender this time, Father. Even more importantly, we surrender our hearts and our lives. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear directly from you, God. Free us from any unnecessary distractions. In Jesus' name. And all together in unity, the church said? Amen. 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 Well, people change. People change all the time. Sometimes for the better and, well, sometimes for the worse. Sometimes people change very deliberately, you know, like with New Year's resolutions or specific goals that they've set. Maybe you've set a goal to get in shape by watching what you eat and by exercising more. And that kind of change is very deliberate. But sometimes change just kind of happens subconsciously. Like you young people here in the room, I promise you're going to wake up one day and wonder, man, when did I get old? When did I become my parents? When did I start saying things like, back in my day, right? Can I just tell you that I don't want to say things like that? It just comes out of me. You also start doing other things like watching the news and checking your rain gauge and telling everybody else how much rain you got in your rain gauge, right? And you're like, when did those things even become enjoyable for me, right? Again, it just happens. There's things that change us, people and experiences. And you know what? If you hang around here long enough, you're going to hear one of us say that a relationship with Jesus changes everything, right? Amen? But what do we even mean by that? Well, earlier I asked you to mark your place there in Galatians chapter 5. Remember, this is a letter written by a guy named Paul to a church in Galatia, which is a region in what is now north-central Turkey. We've read this earlier in our series, but I want us to look at it again today. Look at verse 16. There Paul says, Live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So what is Paul talking about here? Well, I just kind of like I mentioned it just a minute ago, he's saying that a relationship with Jesus changes everything. Please understand that just coming to church doesn't change anything. Just knowing about Jesus doesn't change anything. No, it is a relationship with Jesus that changes everything. In fact, what happens is that Jesus gives you his righteousness. He gives you his perfection. So what he actually makes you in God's eyes listen, is holy and perfect. So that when God looks at you, and this is really good news, when God looks at you today, if you have a relationship with Jesus, he doesn't see you or your mess or your sins. Instead, he sees Jesus. And that's really good news, especially if you've had a bad week, if you've just totally blew it, made a mistake, a failure, a sin, So when God looks at you today, he sees Jesus, and it's that very truth that makes it possible for his spirit to live inside you. You see, whenever we read through the Old Testament, what you see is a God who so desires a relationship with his people, but he's holy, and they are not. 
Because of that, every time that they get too close, he says, whoa, 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 stop right there. Back up. Don't come too close. I am holy and you are not. So one of the most amazing things about the gospel and about Jesus is that he makes it possible for his spirit to not just come close, but to actually live inside of us. And when that happens, what Paul's saying is that this war begins. There's this battle that begins inside of you between God's spirit and our flesh. You see, again, your flesh is that part of you that wants to do whatever you want to do. Your flesh, my flesh, is that part of us that wants to be God rather than to submit to God. And Paul says the flesh and the spirit are at war. Now, as the Holy Spirit comes into you, the process of change is begun. When you have a relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes inside and begins to change you from the inside out, your desires, your convictions. It's a process that Christians like to call sanctification, which simply means that you're changing and you're becoming more and more like Jesus. But what exactly are we changing into? Well, again, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 says that it's the fruit of the Spirit. Simply put, the fruit of the Spirit refers to characteristics of a Christian. It's what we should be becoming the more that we follow after Jesus. And please note, as you see it there, that it's the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit. It's singular, not plural. All of those things that are listed there should be increasing in your life. It's not like you have some a la carte fruit bar where you get to choose which ones you want. Oh, look, I love some love there. Joy's looking pretty good, but man, I don't give me any of that patience. I'm going to stay away from that one, right? It doesn't work that way. We should be increasing in all of these areas as we become more like Jesus. But the question is, how? How do we become more like Jesus? Well, Jesus actually gives us the answer in John's gospel, chapter 15, verse 5. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And then he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, if I were to ask for a quick show of hands and I said, how many of you want to be more like Jesus? Or how many of you want to make a change? All of your hands would go up in the air, right? But listen, here's the promise. Here's the call of Jesus. How close you stay to Jesus will determine how much fruit you bear. Let me say that again so that it sinks in. You want to change? You want to bear fruit? It all depends on how close you're willing to stay to Jesus, like a branch on a tree. Imagine having a branch of an apple tree. You want to see some fruit on that branch. So what do you do? Well, you break that branch off from the tree, right? Well, that doesn't sound very helpful, Steve. Oh, but here's the good news. We tend to think that, you know, every single Sunday morning from 845 at 845 or 1030, if you just kind of bring that broken off branch kind of close to that tree for an hour, maybe hour and 15 minutes if the preacher is long-winded, Maybe some of you, it's once a month or one Sunday every six weeks or so. But let me ask, how many apples are going to grow on that branch? How much fruit is going to appear? Absolutely none. Nada. Zip. Zilch. Zero. Now, I say that because some of us expect change by simply coming here for an hour, an hour and 15 minutes on Sundays. But that is not the same thing as abiding in or remaining in Jesus. See, it all comes back to being in a close relationship with him. In this process, you begin to discover that Jesus is the treasure and that nothing, absolutely nothing, is more important or more valuable than he is. And keep this in mind as we talk about the fruit. Again, remember, we've said this all along. We don't exalt the fruit. No, we want Jesus. And the more that we have of him, the more we'll become like him. So please keep that in mind as we look at the last two fruit on the list today, gentleness and self-control. Now, what is gentleness? Well, if you're somebody who likes to take notes, I'm going to ask you to write it down this way. Point number one there on your outline. Let me start with what gentleness is not. Gentleness is not weakness. No, it is strength under control. Gentleness does not imply somebody who's wimpy or weak. It's not referring to somebody who's a pushover. 
Maybe one of the best definitions would include somebody who is kind, mild, especially when it comes to dealing with other people. Gentleness describes somebody who walks in humility and self-forgetfulness rather than somebody who's self-absorbed. In a word, I would say that gentleness is meekness. Again, not weakness, but meekness, which describes the strength that is under control. Now, play with me just for a second. Clear out your minds just for a moment. I want you to try to think about the picture that comes to your mind when I say the word gentleness. When you hear that word gentleness, what's the first thing that pops into your mind? Maybe you think about a sweet little baby, you know, goo goo, ga ga, sweet little baby. Maybe you think about that picture that you saw on Pinterest with that little bunny rabbit and that kitten taking a nap together. Ah, oh, so cute. Although you have no idea how they got those two animals together, but it's really cute and it's really sweet, right? Or when you think of the word gentleness, maybe you think of a feather just kind of gently floating in the breeze. Whatever it is that's coming to your mind is probably something that's soft and weak. But we know that that's not what Paul is talking about here. And how do we know that? Well, it's because one of the only times that Jesus described himself in the scriptures, well, he used the word gentle. Let's see it for yourself here. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. It's a famous passage. Jesus is speaking here. Some of you are going to be very familiar with this, while others might be hearing it for the very first time. Matthew chapter 11, when you get there, look at the very end of the chapter, verses 28, 29, 30. There Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am, what? Gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Make no mistake, gentleness is not weakness. We know that because Jesus was gentle. Hundreds of years before Jesus was even born, the prophet Isaiah spoke of this Messiah, this powerful king that was to come. Conrad talked about this in the communion meditation. And in Isaiah 42, he said, you know what? If, if he was walking by and he saw a bruised reed, you know, one that was just kind of bent over, he wouldn't just break it off. Because again, he is that gentle. In the very same way, if he's walking by and saw a candle, never in a million years would he just snuff it out. Why? Again, because Jesus is gentle. Even when he made his arrival here on earth, how did he do it? Did he show up as some jacked Captain America superhero? No, if he wanted to, he certainly could have done that. And let me just tell you, he's coming again like that one day. But when he first came, he came as a baby. A sweet, gentle baby. Then he grew up in obscurity and poverty, the son of a carpenter. When he began his ministry in his 30s, his cousin John saw him. Do you remember what he said? He said, behold the what? The lamb. Behold the lamb. Now, let me ask, is there an animal that's any more gentle than a lamb? But at the same time, let's not forget that he's God in the flesh. He's powerful. He can do anything. But he never used his power to bully or harm or intimidate. Not once did he call down armies of angels to scare anybody into repentance. Not once did he threaten to annihilate people. Although, again, he certainly could have. Instead, what did he do to draw people's attention? He performed miracles, right? He calmed a storm. He healed a sickness. He raised somebody from the dead. And all along the way, he spoke the truth. But he also said, fear not, your sins are forgiven. Stop weeping and just believe. And I'm asking, do you see the gentleness of Jesus? What about the night that he was betrayed and all those guards came to take him away? If he wanted to, he could have wiped him out with a word, but he didn't. Then when one of his followers, one of his disciples, Peter, pulled out a sword and sliced off one of the guard's ears, what did Jesus do? Did he say, good job, bro? No, not at all. Instead, he bends down, picked up that ear, and he healed the guy. So again, I'm asking you, do you see the gentleness of Jesus? If you can't see the gentleness of Jesus, then look no further than the cross. 
take just a moment and picture that in your mind. The innocent, spotless son of God, betrayed, stripped, beaten, crucified. Again, if he wanted to, he could have ended it all in a second, but he didn't. Nor did he fight or curse the people who put him there. Instead, what did he do? He simply prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. This is what gentleness looks like. Strength under control. A perfect blend of power and love. Truth and love. But Jesus also gave tough love at times, didn't he? Which we all need. I love the way that John Piper said it. He said, people with thin skin would have often felt hurt by Jesus' piercing tongue. People who identify love only with soft and tender words and ways would have been repeatedly outraged by the stinging, almost violent language of the Lord. He spoke the truth in love. Do you guys remember when he was telling the disciples about how he was going to be betrayed and handed over to be murdered? It was Peter who stood up and said, no way, Lord, that's never going to happen. What was it that Jesus said to Peter? Do you remember? He said, get behind me, Satan. Can you imagine if I called any one of you guys Satan here this morning? You'd be so ticked off and offended, you'd run out of here like your hair's on fire, right? I also remember Jesus teaching about sin. He said, hey, is your hand causing you to sin? If so, cut it off. If it's your eye causing you to sin, so pluck it out. Why? Because sin is serious and it separates you from God. He taught about hell just as much as he taught about heaven. And he did so in a way that would offend people in some churches today and cause them to leave. In fact, some of you are uncomfortable right now just because I said the word hell. But yet Jesus had this way. He had this gentleness. Do you know who he was the toughest on? He was the toughest on the Pharisees. He was the toughest on those people who knew the truth but didn't really live it out. Again, he was the perfect blend of truth and love. And if we're honest, we have to admit that most of us lack biblical gentleness. You see, we're either on one side or the other. Some of us really love truth, but we're not so big on love and grace. Well, for others of us, it's just the opposite, the other extreme. We're all about love and grace and do whatever you want, but we ignore the truth. Christian, we need balance. But let me ask, why is gentleness so important anyway? I mean, why is it even on this list? Seriously, stop and think. When was the last time you actually prayed and asked God to give you more gentleness, right? Very few, if any of us, have ever prayed that prayer. But we need to understand why it's so important. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 and 25. He said, the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. Some of us here in the room, we're really passionate about the truth. The problem is, we're jerks about it, aren't we? And Paul is saying that if you want people to come to know the truth, then you've got to be gentle. Listen, if you're here in the room right now or following along online and you know Jesus, well, then you also know somebody in your life who doesn't know Jesus. You probably want them desperately to know Jesus, so much so that you want to just shake them right now, right? But friend, that's not going to work. God says, if you want them, if you want me to grant somebody repentance, if you want them to know the truth, then God says, I want you to be gentle. Now, let me be very clear here. I'm not saying that you should avoid the, church, the, the truth or, or water it down in any way. Why? Because the word of God is truth. Amen? The word of God is powerful. Amen? We just need to remember that gentleness is strength under control which is why we need to be gentle when we present the truth and when we teach and when we correct. Again, gentleness does not mean weakness. It means presenting the truth in love. I know that can be really difficult at times because we live in such a, a dark, dark world, don't we? But what are we called to be? The Bible calls us to be light, right? And I realize that sometimes it's easier to just rail against the darkness with truth rather than being gentle and rightly representing Jesus. But we need to understand that gentleness is actually incredibly powerful. 
You see, it's the means by which God will actually change people's lives. Think it through. Let me ask you, did you become a Christian because somebody kept screaming and yelling at you about it or arguing with you about it? Or was it because somebody kept loving you in spite of you and they kept inviting you to church and praying for you? Again, it's the gentleness of others that opens up the door for the truth. Gentleness is extremely powerful and we need to be a gentle people. Well, now let's turn and look at self-control. What is self-control? Well, definitions include somebody who's not impulsive, somebody who possesses power over themselves, as well as the ability to say no to sin and yes to God, which being, brings us to our second big idea here today, point number two there in your notes. Go ahead and write it down this way. Self-control is only found outside of yourself. Self-control is only found outside of yourself. And if we're honest, we have to admit that every single one of us, we have a problem with self-control in some area of our lives. For some of us, it's our emotions, right? Anybody willing to admit that they have a problem controlling their emotions? I'm not just talking about anger, although that's a big one, right? Some of y'all, you will cry at a superhero movie, right? This last Friday night, my wife and I got to see that new Twisters movie. Spoiler alert, it's about tornadoes, okay? Which I know hits pretty close to home for us living here in Lawrence, Kansas, right? We saw it in one of those extreme 4D theaters. Man, it was awesome. Your seats shake and move around. They hit you in the face with wind and rain, and there's lightning strikes all around you. I think we need the very same thing here in church. It would keep you awake on Sunday mornings, right? My point is this, we just survived an F5 tornado and all the ladies in the audience are crying because the main characters fell in love, just like they do in every single movie ever made, right? Or maybe for you, it is an anger issue. I've already confessed in this series that slow drivers are a problem for me, right? Some of us, we have trouble controlling our words. We're always saying things that we wish we could take back or we're posting things online that we wish we could delete. For some of us, it's food. Diet and exercise is a problem. Now, I have been accused of never, ever preaching on gluttony. Well, listen up, I'm doing it now. Mark it on your calendar, right? Confession time for me, it's chips and queso, especially the churi queso at Lulu's on Castle. Get behind me, Satan, right? <laughs> For others of us, it's a bit more serious. It's, it's a vice or an addiction even, and we just can't stop. Or if you're sitting here today and you can't think of anything that you have a problem with self-control with, well then, my friend, your pride is out of control because we all have something. And our problem with self-control, listen, it becomes most evident when you come to know Jesus. Why? Well, when you start a relationship with Jesus, the Bible tells us that he breaks the power of sin over your life. So whether you know it or not, before you knew Jesus, you were under the power of sin. You had no choice. You just didn't. But when Jesus comes in, he breaks the power of sin in your life so that now what happens is that every time you sin or every time you come face to face with a temptation, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us that God is always faithful to give you a way of escape, right? Always. So there will never, ever be an opportunity or situation in your life where you could say, well, man, I had to sin. I mean, I had no choice. I had no way out. Not at all. The power of sin has been broken. You are now free, and you always have a choice. The problem is that we don't have self-control. And soon we begin to understand this battle and how difficult it really is. The Apostle Paul describes his own personal battle with self-control in Romans 7, verse 15. He says, the problem with me is that I'm all too human. Paul says, I I'm a slave to sin. I want to do what's right, but I don't. Instead, I do what I hate. Have you ever had that kind of experience in your life as a Christian? I don't get it either. Uh, friend, listen, I so want to do this. I want to live for him and honor him with every area of my life. 
But the thing that I don't want to do is what I end up doing. Again, the problem is self-control. So when you look back at Matthew 11, verse 28, now let's look at it again. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Who's Jesus, Jesus talking to in this, in this moment? He's talking to a group of people who are trying really hard to be good. They're weary and they're burdened. Another translation, Jesus says, all you who labor. He's talking to a group of people who are trying really hard to do this. Do you guys know how many laws are in the Old Testament? 613 laws. Let me just ask, how y'all doing with those laws? Are you keeping them this week? No. No. See, Jesus is talking to a group of people who are working hard. They're carrying this burden, and they're tired. Why? Because they don't have the self-control to do it. No matter how hard they try, they still fail. It's a hard thing to be good enough for God. In fact, in and of ourselves, it's impossible to be good enough for God because God demands perfection. So in order to be good with a perfect God, he demands perfection. And listen, we don't find perfection by doing this perfectly because we can't. Romans 3.20, Paul says, no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. Instead, the law simply shows us how sinful we are. Let's have a little more confession time. Have you ever been driving in your car and for whatever reason you find yourself speeding? Come on now, be honest. Raise your hand if you've ever sped before. Get your hands in the air. Let's be honest. I need to see your hands because we have police officers right outside. (laughs) They're coming in, right? Let me ask you this question. At what point did you know that you were speeding? You know that you're speeding when you see that sign that represents the law and tells you the speed limit, right? Or when you see the flashing lights in your rearview mirror. Paul's saying that's exactly what this is. The law was simply meant to show you that you can't measure up, that it's hopeless, and you're helpless to make yourself right with God by being a good person. Friend, it's impossible. And you will wear yourself out and be discouraged because of the war that's raging inside of you. You can't be good enough. You can't be perfect because at times, listen, at times... Your flesh will win. And if you're basing God's love for you, if you're basing that off of your own performance for him, it will crush you. That's exactly what's happening with these people here in Matthew chapter 11, which is why Jesus is saying, hey, guys, come to me. Listen, you're tired because of this yoke that you're wearing. Take my yoke instead. Now, most of us here in Kansas, anyway, we know what a yoke is, right? Just in case you don't, kids in the room, I'm not talking about eggs here. Let me show you a picture up on the screen. Can you see it there? A yoke is a contraption that would bind two oxen together, and it would keep them close so that they could do work. And Jesus is saying, you are yoked to the law. In essence, you're yoking yourself to yourself. You're the only one under that thing. And you're trying to pull a load that you just can't pull. And you're wearing yourself out. Put it down. Jesus, put it down and come to me. And take my yoke of grace upon you. He's saying, stop trying to do it on your own. Because I already did it for you. He says, if you'll come to me and if you'll take my yoke, you'll find in me a hope and a peace and a righteousness before the Father. Again, it's a relationship. His yoke is a bond. And when you take his yoke, he promises to teach you something. Did you see it there in Matthew chapter 11? Look at verse 29 again. He says, you will learn, right? And what will we learn? Well, Paul put it this way in Titus 2, verses 11, 12, and 13. He said, for the grace of of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And listen to this. He says, it teaches us, here it is, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, 
the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So his yoke teaches us to live differently. He's the only one who can teach us how to live lives of self-control. I can't do it, but he can. It's the central, essential message of Christianity. Listen carefully. The central, essential message of Christianity is not behave or be better. No, the essential message of Christianity is behold. Look at Jesus. Look at what he has done. Look at the cross and see his love for you. Look at the price that he's paid so that you can be forgiven for every mistake that you have ever made and every mistake that you will ever make. Look at him. Because the more that you behold, the more that you will behave. By his grace, he will teach us how to live a life of self-control. Because the bottom line is this. When we love Jesus more than anything else, well, self-control just flows. It's so easy to say no to sin when we're madly in love with Jesus. That's why the most important command in the Bible is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Because when you love Jesus more than anything else, well, then all that other stuff just falls into place. Listen carefully. You will not find gentleness or self-control apart from spending time with Jesus. It all comes back to where we started. This idea of abiding. It's spending time with him and reminding yourself of who he is. It's what we did earlier this morning when we worshiped. Fix your eyes on this one truth. Abide, behold, fix your eyes on Jesus. My prayer is that we would be a church that so values Jesus, that he's our treasure, that he's our everything, so much so that our lives would just totally revolve around him. In fact, as we close in prayer this morning, I want you to take a moment and ask God if there's anything in your life that he wants you to move or change or rearrange so that you could spend more time with him. Maybe for you, it's as simple as waking up a few minutes earlier so that you could spend some time in his word. Maybe for you, it's when you're in your car and you commit to only listening to worship music. Ask him yourself and just be quiet then and let him show you what he wants you to change. In fact, let's do that together right now. Will you pray with me? Father God, it's so crazy to think that you actually want to spend time with us. So crazy to think that you want to be close to us. Who are we that you are mindful of us, Lord? Thank you for changing us from the inside out. God, thank you for Jesus, and thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you that we live in a time and place where we have so much, but everything that we have is from you, God. And I pray that we would not be a distracted people. Please, Father, give us grace and strength this week to rearrange our schedules, maybe to put a phone away, or maybe to just sit with you in a room and pray, or even to go on a walk and just sing to you, not to earn anything from you, but simply because of what you've already done for us through your son, Jesus. Lord, I pray that we'd be a church that looks more like you, that we'd be people of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. We want all the fruit. But even more so, Lord, I pray that we would want you, Jesus. Please stir in this church a love for you that people can see for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Listen, I don't ever want to assume that every single person in this room has already come to Jesus. Jesus is still inviting people to come to him today. And I just want to extend his invitation to you right now. Friend, again, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. He's longing to lavish his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness on you. All you need to do is come to him with a heart of surrender and repentance. You gotta be willing to take off the yoke that you're carrying and desire to do life your own way. You've gotta lay that down. Take his yoke. You've got a choice to make. One way or the other, you will make a choice today. You will either say yes to him or you'll say no to him. 
In just a moment, we're all going to stand and sing a closing song together, and that's going to be your cue. That's going to be your invitation to come forward, to come to Him. I'd just love to meet you here and, and pray with you and talk with you a little bit more about what it means to have a relationship with Him and to follow Jesus. Or maybe you're here today and you've already, you already have a relationship with Him, but you have some other need in your life and you just like to partner in prayer together. Really, this is your opportunity as well. So whatever your need, please come forward as we all stand and sing together now.
Thank you so much for joining us this morning, church. It's been wonderful worshiping with you all. Glad to have you. Hope to see you next Sunday. Have a great week, church. Thanks again for listening today. We'd love to hear from you. If you'd like more information about our church or if you just want to share what God's been doing in your life, drop us a line. Give us a call. Again, may God bless you.